Cropper. Welcome Hello, to the show, my friend. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited. Me big, too. Big honour. No, no, no. The honour is all mine. Um, it's been a long time in the making. We've been talking about this for a while. Your busy schedule, which we'll get into today, um, is quite elusive to get into. Let's be honest. Been... Your busy schedule. No, no, no. You've been a busy, busy man. So it's a very good to finally tie you down. It is a really an honour to get you in and super excited to, to have a chat. Um, you've been a, a big, um, I want to say a, a mentor for me in the last year and I think the knowledge that I've got off you from like three discussions we've had, I thought this is rude not to share this with, with everyone else, um, if that's okay with you. I'm pumped. Awesome. Um, firstly, I'd like to go into like, how did we first meet? Which was what, like two years ago now? I don't know if you know this, but when my son, my second son was born, he wasn't sleeping at night. And so I was just kind of rocking him to sleep at three in the morning. And I started listening, this is 2018. I started yeah. listening to your pod. So I texted Maddie DeBoer. So my pod put your son to sleep. Is that what it, it kept me awake? Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. While he was trying to fall asleep. Yeah. So I texted Maddie DeBoer and I'm like, this still guy's really good. Like he's he's because I'm obsessed with interviewing. And so I texted him, he's like, Yeah, he, he is good. But this was in the like you interviewing people at the footy club days. Like the if you go back to those early days, it's, it's kind of like man, if you think I was good then, geez, they would I can't even listen to those. They yeah. suck. So I looked at that original thread. So um I was I was a fan from the early days and then we met one day in Fitzroy randomly when you were shooting something for Channel Ten and I was in the park with my other son. Yes. Yeah, that you were running around the hill doing something. So. Let's not talk about that. So but, um, it's, you know, f from fan to guest, pretty epic story. No, no, it's, um, it is, but it's funny how it worked because I remember um, a mutual friend of ours, Matt DeBoer, who you just mentioned, obviously the Giants. Um, and, you know, most of the Dylan Friends OG fans would have listened to Matt DeBoer's episode. We both have so much admiration for him and what he's done. And, um, you know, he puts, I don't want to embarrass you today, but he puts a lot of, you know, what he's been able to do in his space with athletic ventures and not only that, but just set himself up post football um, to the mentorship that you've been giving him too. So massive credit to you. And I suppose we'll get into all of that today of what you guys have, have been up to. Yeah. Just on that though, the, the involvement with athletic ventures, they're killing it at the moment, like with, with what they're doing, um, they're investing in everything, left, front and center. It's so good. Like I reckon that's one of the best investment firms in Australia. And it's, for people who don't know, it's a group of about 100 elite athletes. Matty DeBoer runs it, but it's a community of athletes. They pull their cash and they invest in the best startups mm. alongside the best investors. And it's just awesome. So like smart. The quality and the like the way that community treats each other, helps each other. You know, I'm, Matty added me to the WhatsApp thread. I keep quiet because I'm not qualified to be in there, but it's just awesome. Anytime any of the athletes have a win, the whole community comes together and they've got the portfolio that's, just awesome. Mm. Like he's done such a good job. He's so under the radar. Oh, he's, I'm very excited. And I, we said this in the episode, but the, the, the sky's the limit for that bloke. Like post football, he's going to be something very special. I know we both know that. Um, I'm actually part of athletic ventures, right? Like I can sit in and all these, you know, meetings we have and sit in on the pitches. The one thing Matty won't do though, is he won't, he won't add me into the WhatsApp group because I don't think he wants me like hitting up and annoying the fuck out of all of the like the high profile athletes that are in the group. So he's keeping me far away as that group as possible. I've yeah. got to make sure I get it. There's some good names in there too. There's some good names. Yeah. I'm going to hit Matt. I want in that fucking WhatsApp group. That's the only thing I'm in there for. Yeah. 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 He owes me one too. That podcast is amazing. That you, Like if you take anything from our chat today, listening to this, go listen to Matt DeBoer's uh, episode last year. I just probably, I loved it. I think he's going to have recycled everything that you've told him today. So <laughs> maybe this is from the horse's mouth will be, will be the best way to get it. Um, mate, I want to get into everything you know, you've done, but I think it's always nice to start at the beginning. Tell us a bit about your childhood. Where'd you grow up? Um, what was the interest? How did it all work? Yeah. So born in Newcastle, grew up in like 40 minutes outside of Noosa. 12 acres of rainforest, just growing up playing cricket and basketball and running rampant with my little brother. So I was super idyllic, but like a really long way from like where I am now. Mm -hmm. Like my dad made furniture for a living. He had this huge garage where he would had all his machinery. So it was sort of, it's been interesting. Like growing up in rural Queensland, it's like a good place to start your life because everything after that, you kind of always anchor it to where you came from. and. I always, I still kind of pinch myself. Like to be in the Athletic Ventures WhatsApp group is still a, a thrill or a trip to me. I can imagine. That felt so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can it's imagine. so good. Yeah. Um, it's a trip because, yep. uh, you know, I, it just feels like a long way from where I came from. So I had an, I had an awesome childhood. Um, I studied law at uni. Mm -hmm. It was just absolutely trash. I was so bad at it. Like 
Yeah. What sort of law? Like, uh, like so I have a just law generic degree. law? Is yeah. that the, what you yeah. do? Yeah, just generic, generic law. Like I had aspirations to be a human rights lawyer, mostly because I thought it sounded like a good thing to say to my mum and dad's friends. But I was hopeless. And so like one thing I really talk to like, especially younger people now, about now is energy. Like pay attention to what happens to your energy. I was just flat for the entire time I studied law, but my brain didn't click like, you're bad at this. You get no energy from it. You have to drag yourself to just even pass every exam. And I'm just surprised I the six years, of, what, what a waste, mm. you know? Like, so to people who are in that 18 to 24 gap, if you're not interested in getting energy from what you're doing, it's a sure sign you're in the wrong spot. Wow. We're literally just having a very uh, linear conversation with uh, our new producer, Sam Dalton, um, as well as Sam Bonza. But Sam was working in a career in want, changed it. He's working with us now. He's doing some landscaping. And I'm like, fucking oath. Like, how good is that to realize that, you know, this early? Because for some people, it takes a long time to work that out. And 100%. we speak about it. And I hate it. You know, I said the exact same thing. It's not as easy as just going, fuck this, I'm not going to do it anymore. Because there is jobs, there is bills to pay. You know, a lot of people have families, but you can just make that slow progression to, to finding else what you want to do. And most of our influence, like a lot of what we do is like trying to please our parents at some level mm. or parent-like figure. But our parents grew up in a generation where like, just to get by, you really wanted a job and you wanted to be in that job for 30 years. That's not our world now. Like think about, Imagine if in high school, if you'd pitched to the like school counselor that you were going to start, like your success in life professionally was going to be Dylan Friends. That would have been like, what's a podcast? Like what's producey? Mm. You know, like like it just it, it didn't even exist. And now here you are. And so I think like reacting more to energy and environment and, and not to that, like a lot of the choices that I see people make in life, they're making for someone else or against some model of the world that like someone else has given them. Like... You know, a lot of people in, in our world, like we're we often trying to convince people to join a startup. Now, if you go to a barbecue and you're like, oh, I work for this startup, people are like, what the, what's that? That doesn't even, that sounds risky or like that's a bad idea. Or if you say, oh, I work for the Commonwealth Bank or I'm a doctor or whatever, people are like, oh, that's so impressive. Mm -hmm. You must be such an impressive person. But actually those jobs suck. Yeah. Like, you, no offense. No offense to, <laughs> um, and I love the Commonwealth Bank, yeah. um, happy, happy customer. But actually being a doctor sucks. I'll, I'll stay on record as saying yeah. being a doctor yeah. sucks. But those professions that society thinks are like the really good ones, they're actually like, a lot of them are, have like got to the point where they're not that good anymore. Yeah. And I think the stuff that you're doing is, is where the next generation is going and that's actually super exciting it's super like you know we're, we are we, we walk in here every day and i hope the whole team does we, we know how blessed we are and i know that you'd feel the same walking into your job and i think sometimes the passion of when you talk to other people it can come off as like trying to be you know tell people what to do but it's just like i just want you to be like happy like what i'm doing yeah. you know i love this and i know that people can do that as well so um it is, it's, yeah, young people now feel really good at being like, well, I saw the, the great resignation thing they were saying the other day. It's not actually a great resignation. It's just more people don't want to work for your jobs. They just want to do what they want to do. Yeah. So there's a bit of both. What was the um, pivotal moment for you then to decide to go, fuck, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to change yeah. up. I want to, and what did you go to? Not everyone gets a pivotal moment, but I had one which was, uh, so I could always write, like all through high school, I knew like, just writing came super easily. And my theory on this is when I was in like, eight years old, there was a thing called the MS Readathon where you could read as many books as you can in I a month. Do you remember the MS Readathon? This. Yeah, I do, yeah. yeah. So I read like hundreds of books that <laughs> month to the point where like I had an eyesight issue that I had to go get <laughs> checked out because I've been looking at like books for too long. I won a tennis racket, like I was the hero of the MS Readathon. But like I read so much up to the age of eight. My theory is that like I've seen all sentences that have ever been written <laughs> yeah. to the MS Readathon. <laughs> So anyway, really I can write. Yeah. So I, when I was when I was not doing very good at law, I um, uh, not very well at law, I should say. Um, I just emailed the editor of the paper in Queensland called the Sunday Mail, and I was like, I want to write a column for you, where I'll write a profile each week on a really inspiring young person. Mm. And my thing was, none of these people will spend time with me because I'm just nobody. But if I ring them and I say, Hey, I'm from the paper and I want to profile you everyone says yes to that and so my like career hack for figuring out what i wanted to do was talking to other people about what they wanted to do and the way i got them to talk to me was by being a journalist so i had this, i didn't know that that's yeah. awesome so i was meeting i met 
like literally a puppeteer. I was like, that's cool, but not for me. Um, I met a jeweler. I was like, okay, that's amazing, but I could definitely not do this. Um, I met a poet, like full-time job as a poet. I was like, okay, that could definitely, like I like writing, I'm not gonna be a poet. Someone's like, oh, you should meet these guys. They're entrepreneurs. I was like, hmm, entrepreneur. That's like a, that's cool. I had no idea what that was. But I was like, sounds exotic. <laughs> and I went and met them and there was three of them working out of the same office. This is when I was in Brisbane. And like five minutes into that conversation, they were like, let's run a half marathon together. Let's do this. Let's do this. this and they were all early twenties. And they were, I was like, oh, there's a kind of person in the world that wakes up every day and does exactly what they want to do. Like, exactly the cho- like they own their choices so like they don't work for someone people work for them and that was like a light bulb moment coming back to energy the energy i got for these guys i was like my whole i was 25 at this point the whole life that's who i was but i just didn't realize that there were other people that had that energy as well and so like i met them and then they were they were just going what, what are you doing do come and do a startup and so six months later i just sort of like okay you guys seem to know what you're doing so i went and joined a startup first employee it was like a, it was a music startup and then basically that just kind of that's where it all started it's unbelievable it was awesome so the, the funny story or not so funny story is my sister who's 10 years younger than me so she would have been 15 my job that night was to pick her up from the train station <laughs> and i was so in the moment <laughs> but like two hours later i was like oh my god I've forgotten to figure out my sister. So like, it was just a sign of like, it was, I was so like, just motivated and inspired. And then, yeah, it was just kind of like, my whole life I'd sort of always had this sense of like, wasn't quite in the right place. And then I met these guys and I was like, this is where I belong. Give us a, a, a 101 and people that know who you are and what you've achieved will literally want to bash me for like treating asking you these questions but give me a 101 on like what a startup is yeah to, to someone who doesn't know what that is yeah it's, a, it's it, no one's going to want to bash you because it's it's a, it's a really new thing because i guess the easiest way to explain it like in the world there are businesses and there are heaps of different businesses but the ones that most of us understand are like coffee shops supermarkets bottle shops like the ones we interact with a startup is a kind of business that's set up to grow really really fast And by really, really fast, I mean like within 10 years, it has a hundred million dollars of revenue. And so my part of the world is trying to go and find and invest in businesses that can grow super, super fast. So the problem with a coffee shop, and I think coffee shops are underrated and undervalued in society for what it's worth, but it's really hard to have a hundred million dollars of revenue from a coffee shop, unless you're like Nick from Bluestone. You have a hundred coffee shops. And you can figure out how to, but, but, but having it, the, the process of getting a hundred coffee shops, is, it, that's like closer to sort of like this franchise model where the skill is all in the replication. You know, m- my world tends to be software because, and the internet basically, because the internet enables you to get to the whole world at once, basically. So there are heaps of businesses in the world and there's a subset of businesses called startups. There's no strict definition, but I think of it as businesses that can have a hundred million bucks of revenue in 10, side 10 years. Yeah, and a couple that you've like worked with that maybe people can put a, a mind to or would see in the paper, like someone like Canva, for example, yeah, or um, Eucalyptus Group, who yeah, you know, we are good mates with um, a few of the guys there that have just absolutely dominating. Yeah, what's some other sort of businesses that we, you'd put in that same boat, like that you've worked with, or maybe just ones that are you know the the pinnacle? Like I think um, one that other people would realize in Australia that's really famous is Koala, like yeah. the mattresses. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So at Blackbird, which is a firm that yep. I um, am, a, am a partner at, Canva is the most valuable startup that we've have invested in. It's also the most valuable startup to come out of Australia in the last 10 years. And it's crazy to me that people, more people don't understand this, but like, can, I think last valuation that was public was $40 billion. Mm. Like that's a, that's, that's a, lot a really, money. really big company to have been invented by a couple from Perth. And so, so Canva is Canva shows not just to other to Australians, but to the whole world that Australian startups are companies that come from Australia can be the most valuable companies in the world. It's kind of crazy to think about, right? Like, I always think about it in the Olymp- sense of the Olympics. Like, it's crazy how many gold medals we win for a country of twenty-five million people. We win win- Winter Olympics gold medals, and yeah. there's about an acre in Australia that you can actually ski on. Like, yeah, yeah. It, like we just are so good at sport over and above like our population size. And I think the tr- same can be true for 
people starting companies and Canva is Canva is hard to wrap your head around how special that company is, but also it's the one that most Uber drivers or people you just meet randomly have experienced. Um, Eucalyptus is super special and earlier in the journey. So like 10 years from now, I think everyone who listens to this pod will have encountered Eucalyptus in some way. Um, and then we do a lot of stuff in, well, we, it's kind of more boring, but um, not boring to me, but maybe more boring to the audience. There's a lot of companies that sell to businesses. So it's called B2B, business to business. So they have customers or like they're building software that, um, you know, uh, Allbirds uses or whatever the brand might be. So Well, sometimes like I, I think going really holistic on this whole thing, sometimes for me, everything I've been able to, to, to achieve or I want to achieve, it's more knowing what is actually possible and like talking to people like yourself you're actually just broadening your horizon or listening to this you're actually oh fuck that's actually a possibility like if you don't know it's a possibility you're not going to achieve it because you actually don't know what like it's not there yeah um so i'm just thinking tomorrow i'm gonna yeah just really officially start the startup yeah it's just gonna gonna start the startup from there's a there's a it's pretty cliched in my industry to talk about steve jobs but i'm going to talk about steve jobs he did a commencement speech at stanford university and it's sort of Fun fact is Aaron Sorkin wrote it for him. So it's amazing. Aaron Sorkin, director of the social network, director of West Wing or writer for West Wing. So, but in it, he says, everything around you was built by someone no smarter than you. And that's always stuck with me. And at first you go, no, no, no. Well, they must be smarter than me. But the yeah. older I get and the deeper I get into this, the more it's like, no, no, that's actually a true line. That, that, that there are just normal people doing amazing things all over the place. And then I suppose that's when it, when the venture capital side comes in and supporting people around it is when things can really take off. Yeah, and so just so you don't get bashed, let's talk about venture capital for a second. Yeah, that was my next question. That was the next one. (laughs) Okay, so if you start a business, any kind of business, you need money to buy stock, pay people, like money has to come from somewhere. So most businesses just use the money they get from selling their products, but that can take a long time. Some businesses use like bank loans The problem with a bank loan for a business is if you default on it, bank gets to come after you and that can really affect you. Venture capital is a kind of money that you can get that's perfect for starting a business and perfect for people who want to take, you know, risk to start a business. Because if you lose venture capital, we just go, okay, we all tried our best and we walk away and you can go and start again. So again, it's like a not, it, I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but venture, cap, for venture capital is the kind of money that startups, remember startups are businesses that grow yep. really fast, can go and get. So if startups can just have an idea and come to someone like me, and there's lots of people like me, and say, I have an idea for something that's going to grow really fast. Can I have some money to do it? And that's pretty awesome because that you can create and invent a lot of cool things just by that very relationship alone. Mm. And there's no other place in the world to, to, unless you're super rich to go and get that kind of money now this is all public you, you know i'm a big reader of the afr and, and oh. the, i just can't <laughs> yeah. get enough of it yeah they need more they need, they need more reports if you ask me <laughs> but one that i did love was um about your uh company that you work with now you're a director there yeah uh, yes what's the like the title of that your okay role? so yeah. there's a again this, this is inside baseball inside. we can delete this yeah, if yeah, this yeah. is boring but yeah. my title is general partner love that which basically means like i get to invest money on behalf of the firm yep so awesome you're yeah. the big dog. and yes specific no i'm, I'm one of the big dogs yeah. there's a yeah. few big dogs yeah, yeah. you're the you bit like you are a big dog like but also in real life, you're a big dog as well. You're like 200, I reckon you're 200 yeah, yeah. centimeters yeah, yeah. too. So it's like you, literally and figuratively. You're taller than me on the screen yeah, right now, but. You're a big, big boy. Um, <laughs> in turn, uh, the company though is Australia's biggest venture capital firm. Yes. Now, $10 and billion. Dollars. Yes. Yes. That's a big number. It's a really big number. Like go, go back to that kid growing up on 12 acres in Queensland. Still. How proud are you of that? Like at the moment, like I know obviously there's, you know, you want to. Yeah, it's hard to, hard to, it's so Do much. Do you ever catch yourself with it? Like, yeah. Well, yeah. Because yeah. my pocket money growing up, like at end of high school, I was getting $5 a week pocket money. So you go like seven weeks is how much you need to buy a double CD. This is how old I am too. That's why I was using my pocket money for CD. Now like $10 billion is like a lot of weeks of my pocket money growing up. So but it's actually just a responsibility and um, yeah, it, it, it catches me. Mm. When you're, you're at that space, okay, you're in your big dog chair and you're making these like, you know, really big decisions. Yeah. Like in all seriousness, they are massive decisions. Yeah. And because being 
as skilled as you are. I think one thing that you, you didn't miss, but you're probably too humble to say is people would come to you and specifically you and your business, not just for money, but they're getting money plus they're getting your skills yeah. also to help them grow. Yeah. So you're getting stuff thrown at you. I can imagine as we're sitting here, probably getting a hundred emails of companies that want investment. They want to work with you guys. They want to give um, equity of yourself. They want money and they want to grow. Yeah. How do you decide what, is worth it and why yeah. not because i know how many pitch decks you'd sit through every day and and, yeah. and scream through so the the hard part about it is is most startups when they first get explained to you sound pretty bad like the good ones and the bad ones usually show up on your doorstep as a bad idea so it's even harder it's not just that there's heaps of it it's it's heaps of it and it all pretty much looks not that good the first time you're seeing it and every one of them has a chance like a non-zero chance to be the next Canva. And if you miss the next Canva, that's something you have to live with mm-hmm. for a really long yeah. time. So it's a, you, like you can't dismiss anything. Every, every, you have to give everything, you have to look at everything and say, if this founder is right about what they say, like I'm just going to take them at their word that what they say is going to happen is going to happen. Like you have to, so it's actually quite an optimistic job in that sense. You always have to take the best of things. What I, what I would say is at first it all looks roughly the same and then what you develop over time is the ability to pattern match little things. And so it's it's stuff like how quickly do people respond on WhatsApp? How do people respond to feedback that you give them that's constructive? How quickly do they follow up to show you that they mm-hmm. took the feedback on, changed something or that they took it on, they did it, you were wrong, here's why, this is what they decided to do. So. You, you build a model of like what the best founders are like and then you work backwards and there's like an energy and a drive and a focus and an obsession. And so you kind of just looking for, they never turn up in that perfect, in that way perfectly, but you kind of like trying to get an angle where you just get that glint of greatness coming through. And then if you see it, it's just this incredible feeling inside you. Cause you know, like I probably see like I'll, I'll meet a hundred companies in a year. This is not probably, I know this. Uh, in, out of a hundred companies, I'll invest in one or two, but one or two, but not more than two. So I see a hundred companies, 98 of them are, end up being in like a, a no. So when you, like 98 times, you're like, nah, 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 nah. And then one comes that you want to invest in is the most exciting feeling. It's like, you know, when you fall in love and like, you're like, oh, this could be the person mm. I could be with for the rest of my life. Like you get to, in business, in my job, you get to do that like quite a bit and it's an awesome feeling. It's literally like falling in love because you, you're just raving about what you've seen and the person and then they did this and then I, it's just an awesome, it's an awesome job. So it's one of those weird things where most of it's no, but you, you develop this ability over time to go like, that is special. Mm. How much as well of these concepts, like with the, with the businesses and the people, how much of it is investing in the business versus investing in the person? Like my dream is to invest before you even have the business set up. Like yeah. that's the perfect time for us to start working together. So it's not the business at all because it's literally no, for, first of all, there's either no business or very little business. It's an idea, yeah. And I know for sure that whatever business is on day one won't be the business at 100 or 300 or 500 days. So Eucalyptus, amazing business, but the one they pitched was very different to the one that, they're an incredible healthcare business today. They could have been anything the first day that I pitched. So it wasn't about that. It was just that I thought those founders were so special. And so I'm pretty biased. I don't think all investors are like this, but I'm, I don't know, 97% of the decision is a decision about what that person is like mm. and whether that person is the kind of person you want to spend the next 10 years supporting and whether you trust that person when you're not in the room to make great decisions about the inevitable shit that's going to call, fall across their plate. Have you stuffed up? Have you ever missed? Have you made the wrong Heaps. decisions? Yeah, that's yeah. the other thing about this business. It's so humbling because, um, you know, it's, you don't even want to talk about it publicly, but um, Linktree is a business that pretty much everyone who listens to this podcast will know. Oh, we've got it. We use it. Yeah, amazing. So, like, I knew Alex way back oh, when. No, you didn't. I, I missed. Yeah. And I, I, I still talk to him all the time. I, I just think he's an awesome person. And it's just a reminder like, oh, you idiot. Like mm. I have the capacity every day to make a dumb decision like that, not to invest in, in a founder like Alex. And 
it's just this business is super humbling. That's the one that, you know, I'm only five years into my investing career, yep. but I've already got one that haunts me. Linktree. Linktree. Everyone get out there, download Linktree. And absolutely. It, look, <laughs> like, even though I missed it, like he's such a good dude. Like, yeah. Go, go support Linktree. That's an yeah, awesome we, business. I, I didn't, yeah, I, I use Linktree. I didn't realize that was Australian until yeah. we, we spoke about it a couple of months ago. Yeah. Huge. H- so yeah, good. huge. Really good. The way I was sort of um, comparing this today, why I wanted to get you on is not just about, you know, to learn about what this space is, but it's actually just access you as an individual. Nick Crocker. Again, I don't want to embarrass you, but you're just a, a very high achieving individual. You have incredible structures in your life, like your routine. You're very meticulous. Like I feel like you never sleep. I do. You a sleep. Lot. You sleep a lot. That's Good. the key. Okay, there you go. Okay, sleep. Have we not talked sleep. about sleep? No, as well? yeah. We'll have to get into get yeah. into that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone who's telling you they don't sleep is like missing yeah. out no i agree i, I really like so i'm good oh, i fucking hate those like 5 a.m club i tried that for a bit and i was like i just need my sleep i need 5 a.m club's awesome but if i you, mean yeah it's awesome if you're in 5 a.m club you're going to bed at seven that's true yeah so yeah no, okay. no I, sl- I sleep i sleep a lot good well you've got a lot of high functioning habits and i think no one gets to where you are now without having high functioning habits and i sort of referred to this off camera as realistically if we're putting this in sport you're one of the best athletes in australia if not the world because you're running a company that that's too generous but no no it's not it really isn't it's you you have got very good habits um one thing that i came across and i'm happy i hope that you're happy to talk about it is the analogy of floss the teeth you want to keep yeah is that something you still refer to today because this was something you did a while ago i just came across it like yeah We'd never spoken about it, but the analogy, I'd really like it. Are you happy to sort of expand? Yeah. So, well, first of all, the only thing to remember from this is floss the teeth you want to keep. Okay. So if you want to keep your teeth, floss them. Yeah. That's a really important thing to, you know, dental hygiene is huge for me. But what I realized is I, I used to not floss when I was in my late teens. And I, my dentist said, floss the teeth you want to keep. And I thought, okay, I better start flossing. But actually to turn flossing to habit is pretty hard. Like anyone who hears this and tries to start flossing will like there'll be a really high failure rate. But think about what you're asking yourself to do. You're doing, asking yourself for 20 seconds at the end of the day, after you or before you brush your teeth, same time every time, like it's the easiest habit. And yet how hard is it? And so for me, that lesson was like, actually changing yourself is a skill. Like figuring out, okay, here's where I am and here's where I wanna get to and here's the gap. How am I gonna close the gap? That's a huge life skill that they don't teach you in school and that people don't talk to you about because mm. life inevitably is going to put you in places that you don't want to be. And all of us have a mental model of where we do want to be constantly, sort of almost every day it updates. There's a sense of like, I, I don't want to be doing this. I want to be doing that. So that skill of closing that gap is something people don't talk about enough. And so when I like early on realized actually changing yourself is super hard. So let's say flossing takes you six months to turn into habit. Well, what if you want to change careers or what if you want to go from being morning person to night person, or what if you want to make these big changes in life? Like actually that's the, the like meta skill that everyone should be talking about is how to change yourself. And so I'm like broadly interested in that. And that like the, you know, the biggest thing that I've learned is just the power of, there's a, there's a few things, but I like, First of all, I don't think enough people even bother to ask that question. And if they bother to ask it, they don't fight themselves long enough to get an answer. Like knowing what you want in life is a super, super, super hard thing to solve. And the first time you try and solve it, you're probably wrong. Like if I'd have asked you at the end of your footy career, what do you, what do you want of the next phase of your life? I reckon that would have been a daunting thing. Like you, knew, you know who you are, you know what you're capable of, but what do I want in life is such a hard question and it changes every day. And so I just love that as the starting point. Mm. First of all, most people don't define what they want. And then the second thing is most people don't practice the, the art of going from what, where they are to where they want to go enough. And they're not like any skill, again, like flossing, learning the piano, like a part of it is practice, repetition and reflection. And there's a life part of that, which is, hey, I tried to do this, it didn't work. What could I learn from that? How can I do it better? And that, I think if I've done anything well, it's that I went from really shitty law student with, in Brisbane with no connections to anything to you know the privilege of what I do today, which is being able to you know, work at Blackbird and represent and, and support all the founders that we do. And I did that in, 
you know, whether it was quick or fast for me, there was a lot of growth that had to happen along that way. And to be here today, like that's something that like is mine in terms of what I'm proud of in myself that I was able to do was to, to improve quickly enough to go from there to here. And I see these people that we're hiring at Blackbird now, they're so far ahead of where I was 12 years ago. Mm. If you're joining Blackbird today at 23, the sky is the absolute limit. So, yeah, that's what I think. What, what do you think, like you talk about from Brisbane to now, that that person, what, what do you think actually was the thing that made you improve the most? Like what do you look back now and go, fuck, if I hadn't have got better at this, yep. I would not be here. A few things. So first one is just understanding that everything around you was built by someone no smarter than you. Like that's a really hard thing to internalize. And to your point, sometimes you just need to hear the stories. You just need to talk to someone who's done something really special and go, ah, oh, that is possible. Yeah. And then you hear 30 or 40 or 50 of those and you become friends with the kinds of people that do those amazing things. You just, I, re I realize now and I didn't realize then how much is possible in the, for anyone, including myself to do. I think like a more recent massive change and I wish I had done this at 25 and not, 35 was just learning how to manage my head yeah. so for me I, I learned how to meditate late and I always knew of meditation my co-founder of the business that I started before Blackbird he meditated every day and I would watch him do it and I'd just be like what is that like that's what a waste of, you know I just dismissed it managing your own head managing your own internal voice as you go on the journey I think look everyone has their own some people don't have that voice that holds them back. I think a lot of people do. I'm someone who has to manage that inner, inner, inner voice a bit. And meditation, I think, is the only way where you can get the space to go, shit, listen to how I'm talking to myself about myself. Maybe I can take a different approach. I know I'm going to have that. You know how like people say so many times, you got to do this, you got to do it. I know I'm going to have that moment soon about meditation, but still, it's just not there for me. Like yeah. I know it will be though. Like I know it's going to come and I'll be like, fuck, why didn't I do this earlier? I remember trying to meditate before I figured out how to meditate and I put the phone on and I closed my eyes and tracked my breathing and I was like okay I've been doing this for a while and I looked at my open my eyes look at my phone it been 20 seconds yeah <laughs> that was cool yeah awesome and I'm like yeah. you know what it's not funny. yeah 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 so you know how I, you know how I got across the line yeah. so I got an executive coach mm -hmm. which was just to help me kind of most people I don't know if people realize this but there is a huge industry of executive coaching out there like we understand that sports people, athletes have coaches. So Most you. great leaders in business have coaches too. Is, and, and I'm imagining they're all very similar concepts just relating in different industries or? Yeah. No, sorry. I mean like it's all similar in terms of like, you know, belief, like backing yeah. yourself in, making yeah. calm decisions, like those sort of Some, things. I feel like they're all relevant. Like I feel like they're quite... Um, yeah transferable skills if that makes sense like if you're well, good in business you're good in footy maybe like i wish the founders that i worked with could spend more time with elite athletes because no one gets like no group of people in society get more out of their like the skills and, and abilities they have than elite athletes like if you want to squeeze the orange as hard as it can possibly mm. squeeze go ask an elite athlete how they did it most people in life and in business are not even going close to that level of 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 push um Interestingly though, like first session I go to my executive coach and he says the theme of our work for the next two years is going to be self-acceptance. I'm like, this is a mistake. I've made a mistake here. <laughs> self, what are you talking about? Like, I don't, what, what, what possibly could be the benefit of self-acceptance? But like, actually he was absolutely right. And that was exactly the thing that I was missing. So there are lots of, I think um, a huge part of it is just coming to terms with yourself and accepting yourself for who you are and understanding that you're not like good or bad, but you're on a spectrum of these things and that's constantly changing and you just need to accept that at some level. So executive coaching has been awesome, but the first thing he said, this, our theme of our work is going to be self-acceptance and you need to learn how to meditate and I want you to go and do this course and it's called um, Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction, MBSR. There's a guy called John Kabat-Zinn who's written a book on it. He's a legend. It's an eight-week course. And seven out of the eight weeks, I was like, I was lying there doing the for half an hour, just going, you are joking. I'm lying here just looking at the ceiling, worrying about work. Mm. Like this is not, this is not working. And then week eight, it clicked. I was like, oh, that like, it's not the doing of the meditation. It's just observing whatever's going on and being cool with it. 
So mindfulness-based stress reduction, and there's a there's a company called Open Ground that delivers it all over Australia. So mm. I couldn't meditate, yeah. but that changed it. And now that's probably the, like that's the kind of thing that keeps it all together for me. Yeah, I'm assuming you, um, you haven't as yet, I know you're busy, but we had a podcast with MMR a few weeks ago. Amazing. The best in the business. Amazing. I'm level. But so she good. literally said the two things to me that you've just said today was, my word of the year is acceptance. Like just accepting that sometimes, you know, you're always going to be busy. You're always going to have stresses. You're always going to have things to do, but you just got to accept um, who you are, what you're doing and just accept it. Like that's, that's just the way things are. And doesn't mean acceptance doesn't mean it's good by the way. No. Like, you're not like, oh, I accept myself because I'm awesome. It's like, I accept that there are parts of me that like, I'm so disappointed with right now. I'm so sad about, but I accept it. Yeah. And that like, like so much, so many bad decisions come from the struggle you have with yourself in not just facing up and accepting the reality. Cause once you accept it, then you can deal with it. Mm. But it's this like, I don't want to be, I don't like it's, it's the wrestle. It's so hard to explain, you know, talking about concepts, startups are hard to explain. Venture capital is hard to explain. Meditation is hard to explain, but there's magic in all three. Yeah. <laughs> At least there has we're, been for we're, me. We're debunking them all today with this, <laughs> the, the, the duo. Um, and the second thing was de-stresses. Exactly that, like how to, how to de-stress yourself before the, you know, the breaking point of being stressed um yeah crazy looks like well if you'll bring it up and she is maybe i should definitely start doing it you mentioned before about you know, like you've got your, your er you've got your business coach um as well i know that your schedule is obviously full on you have people that help you you know do that one thing um you wear an aura ring is that true i sure do yeah explain i'd actually never really heard of one of these before like i'd heard of them but i'd never knew, really knew what they did before i had a look at it before yeah, so there's this, this concept in business where if it matters, measure it. Because if you start measuring it, you pay attention to it, you pay attention to it, you can react to it and learn. So, um, you know, I am interested, especially I'm 38 now and like you start to slow down at 38. It's, it's like, again, self-acceptance, but it's disappointing to see how slow, like I wanted to get better at running. It's happening so slowly. No, you're you getting get, better, man. Run clubs, you are getting and better. And you get injured more along the way and your body's, you wake up sore than you ever did. So like I'm motivated now to manage my health more. So the hour ring is really good. Cause it just, hour ring, sorry. Hour. I actually don't know. It's Finnish. Maybe you got the pronunciation aura right. Aura sounds a bit too... No, I think our aura is right maybe. Okay. Let's go with you, aura. So it just gives me all of my like metabolic data in any given day. So the two if, things I yeah. pay attention to is my sleep quality because you can be in bed for a long time but have a shit sleep. Yep. So I look at my sleep quality and I kind of like will react to that. And I look at something called heart rate variability, which is basically a predictor of stress. And so I'm just monitoring if my heart rate variability is super low multiple days in a row, then it's a sign to me that I really need to do something. Um, HRV, heart rate variability, is something really interesting that I don't think a lot of people are talking about, but um, like especially within elite athlete circles, it's becoming more and more an indicator of how hard should I train today? Where am I at? Yeah. And so it's, again, it's, I think generally we're like pretty bad judges of ourselves. And so sometimes having objective data on how you're actually doing is super helpful and then tracking trends over time. And I'm just a nerd for technology as well, but in a sense. Your team has access to this stuff so they can like pull you up on it as well. Is that true? Like the, I, none of them care. Yep. But <laughs> But like, basically, if you wanted to come and get the best out of me, if you saw me with heart, my heart rate bear variability in the 30s, yeah, you'd be like, stop what, what you're doing, clear your calendar, get your head right, yeah, because that's back. way too low, yeah. And then if you're in the 50s, and that's actually, actually both of those numbers are pretty low, yeah. If you're in the 50s, I'm mean, you're like, you must be having a great day today. The um the other thing that I think is is really cool, um, which once I you know spoke to you about this and and read your article on this, um, is something that I feel like everyone should be doing um and i've got so many questions about it because it's it's fascinating and i think you've got to make sure you're obviously surrounding yourself with good people that are um challenging you but you know in the right way because one thing you said before about when you met the the initial guys you're going to work with and you felt inspired how true is it to you and i already know the answer to this but like you are who you surround yourself with it's everything this is something that's really um, like a hard thing to talk about because people really, really value loyalty and for good reason. But I think too few people consider the people that they're around that, that are surrounding them. And often you haven't been conscious about those people are just in your life by circumstance. Mm. 
but you always have a choice about the people that you put around yourself and nothing will have a greater influence on your trajectory than the people that you're surrounded by because all your levels get reset by the people that you're around and I think in like in football circles, it's a huge part of how you get high performance out of a group. You've got a group of people who are all trying to be at the, their best. As soon as you leave that behind, there's no context like that in normal life. That's not what a business is like. That's not what, there's no other place in life that replicates that. So I think being conscious of the people that you that you spend your time with, there's a, there's a concept in, of, of, um, in investing, which Warren Buffett came up with, which is, Imagine that you only get to invest in 20 businesses for your entire life. Is this next one that you do one that you would be willing to say, this is one of my 20 slots. And I saw someone today post a tweet about this where he said, think, take the Warren Buffett investment concept, but apply it to friends. Is this one of the, if, if this person I'm spending time with, is this one of the 20 people that was like one of my 20 inner circle people that I'm going to just, just kind of determine my future by. And I, you know, I think loyalty is super important, but I also think that being conscious of who you're around, it's like, it's okay to, to identify that you're in the wrong group and that you're not surrounded by a group of people that are going to support you to be where you want to be and to go and move into a group that is going to. And so I think we're going to talk about the elephants, but yes. that was what that was for me. Exactly right. Um, definitely alluding to the elephants, but I do want to harp on that again. And it's something that does come up with so many successful people. Um, and I think from my own point of view, I learned this like the hard way because... I would find myself a lot as a young guy coming through hanging, not hanging around with the wrong people that are like, you know, doing anything bad, but just not having a positive impact on me and where I want to get to. And I think that's, it's not like, don't think about this as like people smoking or doing drugs and stuff. Think about it more in terms of like, are they driven to go well in their career? Are they happy in their jobs? Are they competitive with what they want to do? And that's where I was like, fuck, like there's a reason I probably didn't play a lot of senior football. Was it because of my talent? No, like I was definitely talented enough to play. Like I'm not saying that in an arrogant way, but like you have to be to get to the AFL. But it was probably with like surrounding myself with people that didn't have the right mindset as well. And we both aren't pushing ourselves to doing the right thing and, um, and you know, complaining or it's not my fault, it's someone else's. Like those sort of mindsets you can get stuck into when you're with people that are stringing the same shit. So it's probably the biggest learning I've ever had. And I, I just couldn't agree more with, but it can, it can be a nuanced thing, right? Like you can leave a group without anything. There can be nothing wrong with that with group. Everyone. Yeah, no, there's still... Except that you want to go in a different direction mm. and their direction might be fine for them. But if it's not fine for you, then it's okay to go to another place. 100%. Mm. Um, talk us through the elephant group. Yeah, so the elephants, just go back to elephants. how did I get from where I was Please, to where yes, I yes, am. Yes. The elephants is... So there's a there's an article I wrote about this from 2013 and... It's one of the most rewarding things in the world to put something out and you must get this too where you put i put something out in 2013 and people still email me from all around the world about it like we'll have regularly. This in show notes as well and it's really just a simple concept which is like i said before define what you want out of life tell a small group of people what you want out of life get their feedback so it has to be a group of people you trust and then meet up every 12 weeks every quarter and check in on how you're going and then build this small group that's super high trust like super super high trust and so the measure of that is tell each other what your bank account balance is wow. um tell each other you know how you're going in your relationship including the stuff that you're not as happy with or as proud of so like super high trust group so it should be a high bar to, you can't just have an elephants group with anyone and then just work with that group over time because once you've told them once, twice, 15, once you've met them with each as a group 15 times, their ability to give you feedback on whether you're being you or whether you're doing the, what you, whether you are being true to yourself, whether you are on the path you want to be on, that's so powerful. And so for me, it's, it's the, the, the elephants is just a, a structure of how to kind of put a support group around you in a world where there aren't natural places to go for that kind of thing. I'm imagining this now and I'm like putting it in my own head and I'm sure everyone listening is thinking, fuck, who would you have in your group, like in your network, you, like I'm thinking. Is it, would you suggest like if someone was to go and do this, would it necessarily be, not necessarily be like your friends, like that even they're good impacts on you. It might not be them because it might be too close to home. Like it might be something that's too connected. Like, you know. It just comes down to like that extreme vulnerability. Yeah. To say something like, um, I want to, you know, like I, I have a friend who I'm really close to and he's super motivated by being famous. And that could be, you could be, if you go and say that to your mates, I, I genuinely want to be famous. 
imagine how much shit you would get. Mm. But he's decided that's true for him. That's an important thing to him. So it's about, it could be mates. It could be people who aren't mates. But it's actually about people who you can trust to be super vulnerable and then that you can reciprocate that vulnerability. Yep. And so it's, it's actually going just, just almost running through your mental list of friends and just going, who could I have the most awkward conversation with and still trust that they'd be okay at the end of it? Mm. What have you got out of it? Like is there any, like I'm not saying there must be one certain thing, but is there a time where you went in thinking, all right, this is really good. I'm going to do this. Everyone's going to love it. No, I just, you walked out going, oh fuck, I didn't see that one coming. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of what it's like every time. And cause, cause when you have that level of vulnerability, you get back some pretty honest feedback. Hey, I heard the way you talked about that. And that doesn't sound like something that you say. And then you kind of like it rocked like, Oh shit. Yeah. I, I'm not owning up. I'm not being the person that I want to be. I mean, the, probably the biggest impact for me came at the start where I had a group of people who were like, you're not a journalist. You're not a shitty lawyer. Actually, you're an entrepreneur. G- get on the path. Just go and do it. And I remember, I was just like, I remember I had enough savings to pay two, like for sort of two months. I remember taking myself for a walk by the river in prison. I was like, do I start this business or not? And I was like, what happens if after eight weeks I've run out of all my money? And I was, and I was, so I called them. I was like, what happens if I run out of all my money? And um, Simon, who, who took the call, he's like, who cares? You'll figure it out. Like you're like, you'll figure it out. And I was like, I don't think I can do this, but they seem to think that I can do it. Mm. So I'm just going to listen to them in this case and ignore <laughs> my own instincts on this because there's something here that makes me think like maybe I just don't um, making this decision. And so it was it was actually just like them just pushing me off off the ledge for the first time. I remember the first contract I got, which was inside the eight weeks. I, I was like, what's the biggest number I could think of to charge for this bit of work? It was four thousand four hundred dollars. And one of the guys came up and he's like, mm, no. Nah. And he deleted it and wrote fourteen thousand four hundred. And I was just like. This is so embarrassing. Like they're gonna, the client's just gonna say, no way, no chance. I sent it off and they said, yep, let us know when to pay it. I was like, <sighs> and so it was that early kind of like, like they, they enriched me with their kind of bravery and boldness, which I probably didn't have enough of at the time. How, how cool is that when you are surrounded by people like that, that are so comfortable and probably like, you know, believe in their self as much as then they can project it on someone else. Because I know, you know, like, two years ago if someone came to me with help there's still that competitive in me that'd be like fuck this guy i'm not going to help you like i would help myself but i suppose now from learning and growing up there's a bit where you really want to help people you get to a stage where like not that i'm killing or anything but you go like i get a stage where now i really get it out of helping people where sometimes you know people might not have your best interest at heart yeah it's, I mean, that's the whole purpose of the elephants is can you find that group around you that mm. do have your best interests at and are willing to push you? Yeah. It's not easy to do that, but it's worth fighting for because if you have it, you've, you've got something super special. And that same group special. is, okay, how long have you had that group for? So to my point earlier about like moving, so the original group was the group I walked in and wow. met and wrote about for the first time. That was yeah. the original elephants group. Um, but when I moved to the US, it became harder and harder to maintain that. And so I got a new group of elephants when I moved to the US. And now I'm, I don't have an elephants group today because that kind of I've moved back and everyone's got kids. So like it's been a huge reflection for me over the break. Is you know I've had a decade of it, so I've got a huge benefit from it. I'm sort of my own group yep. now. Like I, I do, I still do all the rituals. I still write a quarterly update with all of my key met, like full breakdown of everything that happened over the last twelve weeks. But I just send it to my coach now, so I've got a lot of the disciplines. Yeah. But I'm still like here's the challenge right is as you grow you become a different person and so the things that you need from the people around you change and so i'm transparently like i'm in a phase now of looking for who's that next group of people that i'm going to surround myself i'm, I'm lucky with how great my colleagues are but i think colleagues are tr- sometimes a tricky group to have in elephants because there's some some mismatched incentives exactly. or some yeah. crossover there again can you be extremely vulnerable and so i'm in that transition phase of like who's that next cohort that that i'm going to put around me mm. what's next for you man um you seem like you've got some awesome things ahead of yourself yeah. um there's some big things like is there anything that you can sort of t- tell us about at the moment like have you found i know it's only early in the year but have you found that one yet is there something that's coming or so like i think of my number one job in life is to be a good dad to my yep. boys and there's Which like i see you on your bike with your boys how many k's are you doing a month <laughs> at the moment like with them <laughs> Listen, like being a good dad 
is actually like mostly like very mundane and just about the time that you put in. Like, you know, I, I'm reasonably productive in most elements of my life, but you can't compress the time you spend with your kids to be like, right, I'm going to give them the very best 15 minutes of the mm. day and then I'm going to work. It's like, no, no, they want two hours of your attention and if they get two, they want three. Like it's kind of an end, there's endless elasticity in how much attention and love your kids want. So I kind of have chosen to build my life around that which is, and, and of course my wife, Jules, and I, that's a, that's a shared thing. So when I say being a great dad, I have to be a great partner to her, to be a great dad to them, for Jules, her to be. Jules is a surgeon? She's a hematologist. Hematologist. Yeah, yeah. Blood. Blood. Yeah. I, don't, I couldn't explain hematology to yeah. you in any meaningful way, but. I could, but we'll do it next oh, time. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, no. No, not really. Yeah, she's um she's unreal. Yeah. So so Family. that's that's yep. a like and so I built I actually build my life around that. Which again, if you like if you want to be a good dad, it's not about the Instagram photos of going for a ride. Mm. It's like sitting down with him yesterday when he's hangry and losing his mind because he can't figure out whether he wants to watch the T V or play chess. Like and he's freaking out about it. And you're like no one in no one talks about parenting people are only if you're not a parent you know what it's like if you are a parent you're like oh it's the instagram photos but actually being a parent is all in these tiny moments and in just i'm not that patient so i've had to work super hard to be patient and so that's kind of the kind of core of of and there's also like that sounds like oh being a dad that's such a good thing but like there's trade-offs that come with that like there's a cost to, to making that and then i've fit work around that which is a pretty cool thing to be able to say. Most jobs don't let you do that. Um, and then that's kind of it. That's like 110% of what I can give every week is taken up by work and family. And so, um, you know, this is, this, there's just, we're, Blackbird itself is growing so fast. Mm. Like we were eight people two years ago and we're 50-ish people today. And that just requires a lot of support and work. And, and then, you know, I started this with no companies that I've invested in five years ago and now I've got 10 or 15. And so I'm just trying to survive, get, get by, help everyone that I kind of have promised to help. And uh, I don't know, I'm right in the eye of the storm with young kids though. Like, again, you, you, you will be here soon, I assume, which I is so. yeah. when, you, when, you are, when you have young kids, like, you just feel like you're in a you're in a cyclone and i'm still in the cyclone a bit with them give us um besides investing in uh your children give us the two uh, give us a couple of businesses to look out for um startups to look out for sorry the next sort of 12 to 24 months i can't you just asked you just that's like you just asked me who my favorite kid was i don't i can't um i said a couple so technically you could you but could, then there's then there's 12 that i didn't yeah, mention that i'm yeah, like oh interesting yeah. i saw yeah. i saw you on dylan friends yeah. didn't, didn't mention do you not love me what can i what can i give you instead um let me ask you a question actually okay. i come over here and i have a question this is this is completely unrelated but it's been interesting like as someone that listened to the pod from day one do you consider your football career more successful or your Dylan friends career like what what do you think like when you think about yourself as a success or not because mm. your language is about the two is super different do you feel now like you've achieved more through Dylan friends than you, than you did through footy so if you, if you say success like I think success for me is is like um, not so much like financial it's more like happiness you know it gives me time to do with my family friends I'm happy with what I'm doing I feel fulfilled I have a purpose all those sort of things I wouldn't even compare the two. Like, I think this is like the best thing I've ever done in my life. Um, I actually don't even really like to, I know that like, footy is a big part of my story. Um, what my dream is, is in 10 to 20 years, like I'm not the ex-footballer anymore. Like, I just want to be like what I am doing now. Cause I feel like this is the biggest thing for me. Like, you know, this is what I love doing the most. Um, and this so is- So in, in 2018, you're interviewing Josh Kelly in the GWS rooms. Yeah. How likely was that three years later to be sitting here saying that what you've done now is so like profoundly connected that you almost want to forget mm. that that other part of it? Like, well, did you see that coming? I did. Not, not sorry. I, like, I didn't see it to coming to this extent, but I did it out of fear because um, I did it because I had nothing else. Like, and I knew that it was, there was a timeline. And that's why before when we we're talking about, um, you know, like, how good it is to pick what you want to do when you don't have an option with something 
life is so easy. Like I knew I was getting sacked. I didn't have an option. I was like, I need to fucking do something. I need to start this podcast. I need to try and get a job in radio. I need to do this. But then when you do have options and you, you're doing things later in life, whether it's changing career or you have choices, that's actually when things are the hardest. So I found like that decision to do what we're doing now and do the podcast stuff is so it, it was, was simple because like, there was no other way to do it. But now that we're here and we're doing the podcast, we've got this, we've got list cloggers, we've got, um, you know, we're starting two new podcasts, one we're doing with, with um, Spotify, one we're doing, you know, with Producey and, you know, we're going to do some content for other businesses and that's when it gets like really difficult because you like have so many things and you're like, well, fuck, that might be the most financially rewarding way of the business, but is it actually what we want the business to be? Um, so in a very long-winded answer, I hope that gives context. That's what I'm trying to work through at the moment. And when you said what I loved, you know, I'm really related to most that you've said today out of a lot of things was when you were a journalist and you went and wrote articles about people to like work out what you wanted to do. Like that is something that I don't take for granted to be able to like sit in a room with you, sit in a room with Emma Murray, sit in a room with Richard Harris, sit in a room with fucking all these people. It's very selfish in a way. Like, yes, people are listening to this and I hope they're getting something out of it too. But in a way I'm like, fuck, I'm just getting the best life advice or options and learning things from people that a lot of people don't get to talk to. So, um, yeah, forever grateful for that. I want to push you on one thing which is that none of this is possible without your footy career not being what you wanted it to be. Because here's what's weird, is not being as successful as you wanted to be in footy gave you really high drive. You called it fear, mm. but like what it, all of it amounted to like a momentum and an energy where like had you been super successful in your footy career by your own standards, there's no way you would have worked so hard. Like you're on here and you have this, this very casual like – relaxed everyone wants to be your mate and like we do a running club together mm -hmm. you know we do our run and then people come up and try and get selfies with you like you, you have that that's that's very very powerful but you you owe footy some gratitude mm. for the drive it gave you to do what you're doing today and it gave you the ability to like footy opens people like people are sport is just the most incredible what what, are, what else except sport makes normal people yell and scream at each other on a weekend like sport is incredible for where it takes people to and so people have a fascination but what you've done in terms of like bringing people's heroes on this show and then telling your story in a way that made them feel safe and had them be vulnerable is like super powerful to heaps and heaps of people and again you only i couldn't have done dylan friends like Dylan Friends is a full expression of who you are. And so it's been fascinating to listen to all the podcasts and almost watch you work through what your football career meant to you and then come out the other side of it. But there's one step. This is me being your executive yeah, coach yeah, right yeah. now. It's to be grateful to football. As bad as it was, it's, there's no you today without you and in those 40 years that you, you, you now look back on with some disdain. 100%. You, you've... Yeah, if there was a – no, you've, you've definitely nailed that. Like, And again, I, yeah, I didn't mean to be ungrateful with it, but it's more the fact of like I I was so embarrassed with what happened that it dro it like was the biggest rocket up my ass to be like, don't ever fucking fail like that again. And that's, what, a, what a gift. Yeah, it was a massive gift. And to learn that at such a young age was very, very thankful. But And here's one more thing is when we talk and I tell you about these entrepreneurs, mm. I can see you wrestling – going am i one of am i one of them like i can see mm. you and like i am telling you that your like energy and like the the vibration that you bring into the world that intensity that focus that uniqueness that's very special and you shouldn't set limits for yourself on what this can be to like don't don't set them too close because what you could create from this is there's a momentum to this that could like this is my job to look for people who create mm. movements and things like this. And you've got something really special and don't doubt it. Like you're just like the people that we're talking about that have done things that don't make sense to you, but you're actually way closer than you realize. Thank you, bro. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you for your openness. Thank you for your time. Um, thank you for your lessons and thank you for that. Then that was, yeah, it meant a lot. Um, someone of your caliber to, to, yeah, listen to the show and relate and, and understand me like that. It, it, it means a lot. And um, yeah, just can't thank you enough for coming in today. It's huge. Thanks for having me. Can't wait for the next chapter.
Can't wait. Well, on what that. are we doing, man? Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm vibrating. <laughs> <laughs>